Einstein wrote, a human being is a part of a whole called by us universe. He experiences himself, his thoughts, his feelings, as something separated from the rest. A kind of, this is a great phrase, optical delusion of his consciousness. <laughs> this delusion is a kind of prison for us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our capacity for compassion and to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Chris's opening song was perfect for today as a lead-in to what we're going to be taking a look at. Because we all have moments, days, weeks, of pain, sadness, discomfort, uncertainty, don't we? Mm -hmm. And it's okay, those of you who didn't say mm-hmm, it's okay. <laughs> Ours is a world where each moment actually offers the potential for ecstasy or despair depending on how we perceive it. Humans are not, though, the only inhabitants who savor the bliss of a beautiful spring day. And we are also not the only inhabitants who mourn, or who feel stress, or who worry in our way. Helena Blavatsky, who, anybody know that name? Mm -hmm. Helena Blavatsky? She founded Theosophy. And she called it, by the way, she referred to Theosophy as a synthesis of religion, philosophy, and science. Anybody ever heard that anywhere else? <laughs> And for those of you who haven't heard it anywhere else, it's one of the first sentences that you read in the Science of Mind textbook. She wrote about this, how would I describe it? This, this functionality of our personalities that she referred to as the dweller. And the dweller, the dweller on the threshold is, is actually the whole statement, the dweller on the threshold. And this, what I'm sharing with you, is like taking this very big idea and putting it in a thimble for our purposes today. In essence, the dweller on the threshold is the part of the personality familiar, identifying it as safe and comfortable. <laughs> so, as Chris said in his song, Everybody feels this way sometimes. We all have a comfort zone. And when we start taking a look at what lies beyond that comfort zone, when a doorway comes to us, or we are led to it and we have no idea what's on the other side, what we know for sure is it's going to take us out of our comfort zone. The dweller is the antithesis of the explorer. And we spent a lot of time last week looking at the explorer and the value that 
can be brought to our lives by tapping in to that nature, to our explorer nature, the one that is just itching to go through that door, just itching to take that next step. The thing is, is that the explorer's itch, if you'll pardon the expression, yeah. hasn't been scratched as much as the dweller's itch. <laughs> As uncomfortable as whatever we're experiencing might be, the dweller would rather have us stay put than do anything different. In its view, hazardous and most properly, probably disastrous is the unknown that lies beyond that door, that lies beyond that step. So when we have these messages coming from our brains, our bodies, through our thoughts and feelings, oh no, you don't want to take a chance. You don't want to do that. You don't want to explore that possibility. You don't want to say yes to that opportunity. Oh, no! What happens when we, I'll say, give in to the oh, no, is that we have just abdicated our freedom, our amazing and unlimited potential to the internal or external or both doomsayers, bless you on the truth, who have done nothing, listen, listen up now, these internal or external or both doomsayers who have done absolutely nothing to deserve our attention, let alone our trust. Nothing. <laughs> Are doomsayers providing every breath we breathe? No. What do you think? No. no. Are doomsayers entertaining new thoughts? No. 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 Doomsayers are, I hear the question being asked, what's a doomsayer? A doomsayer is, is an internal thought, or it could be uh, someone in our lives, an external person, who is saying, oh, you don't want to do that. You don't want to take that chance. What if, what if something goes wrong? Then what? You don't want to travel. You don't want to go there. Sidebar. Now, this probably has happened to a lot of you. How many people in the room actually moved to New Mexico from somewhere else? Okay. So this may have happened to some other people in the room. When Denise and I started telling people that we were moving to New Mexico, <laughs> they said, oh my god, why do you want to go there? The crime is terrible. And we said, New Mexico. You know, <laughs> you know the state in the United States that is New Mexico? Oh. <laughs> but that's an example of a doomsayer. You don't want to go there. You don't want to take that chance. What might happen? You don't want to leave your family. You don't want to leave the security of the job you have. You don't want to step into a new relationship because what if it doesn't work out? So what if it doesn't work out? What if it doesn't work out? Is that the only option? Oh. When, when we, oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Finally, I heard this. <laughs> it is the only option. 
if we believe it is. <coughs> Remember what I said about perception. And you hear me talk about this all of the, all of the time. That what we are looking at, we are looking from. And so if we're looking at something and we're thinking, well, that's my only choice, and if it doesn't work out, I'm, um, I've had it, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> I'm toast. <laughs> it's because our, our commitment to that idea is because that is the, the scope of our ability to see what's on the horizon, to open our minds. Carol, this morning, invited us in the affirmations to say, I open my mind. Doomsayers do not have an open mind. And, and the, the opinions that they are sharing with us, now granted, they may have our safety in mind, right? Our, what they believe to be our best interest in mind. They may even love us. It's entirely possible. On the other hand, their view, their view of life tends to be very narrow. And we are stepping outside of what they can imagine. So part of what we're hearing from particularly a person, but it may even be from an internal message, is, oh no, I can't imagine going there, so I don't, I can't imagine you going there either. I can't imagine you taking this risk and if it doesn't work out, still being okay. Because for themselves, they cannot imagine it. Now, we love these people. We even love the doomsayers that we've lived with all of our lives in, in our inner conversations. Because in ways they have supported us, in ways they have served us, in ways they have kept us safe. They have also kept us small. And we have a choice. I'm not saying that everybody is messing up if they don't make a choice to, to step into a new life, to make a big, bold decision. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. Hear me clearly. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. What I am saying is to remember that we have a choice and that the choice is ours to make. We are the only ones who can make the choice and that the choices are available to us and we will be met there and supported in them. That's what I'm saying. So if we're going to make a choice to stay in our comfort zone, then let's choose to enjoy it. <laughs> let's choose to enjoy it. Let's choose not to complain about it. Let's choose not to gossip about other people staying in their comfort zone. I'm serious. <laughs> let's enjoy it. Let's support them in enjoying it. We don't need, nor can we, change anybody else. We can't change their experience. So why am I standing up here talking to you? If I can't change your experience, I can't change your experience. But I can show you what is on offer if you choose. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love when that happens.
that <laughs> when you choose to change your experience. I can show you that. We have fears. We have doubts. Even if we believe in a loving universe, right? Mm -hmm. We may still, but while believing in a loving universe, in a generous universe, in a universe that takes great care of itself as it expresses as us, we might still carry some suspicions known or unknown in our conscious mind that the divine might still withhold <laughs> or be selective. Now, does that mean that we're failing in our practice or doing something wrong? No. When things come up, when these ideas come up, when these questions come up, they are for our examination. They're for our exploration. They're for our questioning as the people we are when? Today. Now. That's where they show up. How, how does, how do I feel about this now? What do I think about this now? What do I choose to do with this now? If we decide that we wouldn't be having these thoughts, and I know this doesn't apply to anybody in this room, but you know, you might know some people, that if we're having these thoughts, we're not a very good religious scientist, or that the science of wine police <laughs> would say, oh no, you've got an issue with your consciousness. <laughs> we're making that up too. Now, we may have been helped, to think those things. We may have been helped along the way to think that, well, if I'm a good religious scientist, if I'm really doing my <coughs> spiritual practice, if I'm really walking my talk, I will never have another doubt or fear again. <laughs> <laughs> and you all know what I call that. <laughs> because we are divine beings having a human experience. And so the fears and doubts that we have, as I've already said, come up so that we can look at it, feel into it, and say, okay, what do I want to do with this now? How do I want to respond to this now? How do I want to be with this now? The idea of a capricious, gotcha God is out of alignment with what we know to be the unfailingly predictable response of spiritual laws that are universal. That's right. Let me say that again. Please. <laughs> the idea of a capricious, gotcha God is out of alignment with what we know to be the unfailingly predictable response of spiritual laws that are universal. So let me do a breakdown on that for you. The spiritual laws that we know to be universal operate the same everywhere, all the time, for everybody. 24-7, no matter who, no matter where. That is not capricious. It doesn't even allow room for an entity that will go, well, I'll favor you, but I, not, I don't like the color you're wearing today, so I'm not going 
kind of thing you do. <laughs> and you, well. <laughs> if we get nervous, when we think about, or for heaven's sake, say out loud that we are feeling fear or doubt, we might do well to remember this wise counsel from one of my dearest and most brilliant teachers. Reverend Dr. Maureen Hoyt reminds us, it's okay to allow anything to move through our consciousness. It's another thing entirely to give it room to pitch a tent. <laughs> Anything can move through. We get to decide whether or not we're going to give it the opportunity to homestead there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have these thoughts and companion feelings that take us out of the now for sure, because fear and doubt both take us out of the now, even though they're understandable, even though they are relatable, they for sure take us out of the now if we dwell there. And they cinch off the flow and ease that we are affirming. Just like putting our foot on the hose. So how do we reverse the process? I know that you've all been waiting to ask me. <laughs> how do we reverse the process? Ready? Ready. You've been waiting your whole life for this, right? <laughs> ready, 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 ready. We don't. <laughs> you heard me. We don't reverse the process. Anybody ever been in a market when there was a small child crying and the parent was saying, don't cry? Oh <laughs> this is sort of like that. We have already felt the fear. We have already felt the doubt. We have already felt the hesitation. That ship has sailed. So reversing the process is not where our attention needs to be because it can't happen nor do we really want it to those thoughts those feelings have shown up as an invitation to notice and to choose so as the explorers, we might choose to allow ourselves to be. We're certainly equipped as explorers. What we can do is what any good explorer would do. Finding themselves in a new situation, which is where we find ourselves when we are feeling the feelings of fear, doubt, worry, whatever the case may be, and we are open to exploring them, knowing that everything's good, just the way it is. We're safe to explore it. Nothing is being done with the fear, doubt, or worry. It's just good where it is. We're safe to explore it. And we have the tools. So what does any good explorer do first when they find themselves in a new situation? They take in their surroundings. Because the fear, doubt, and worry is not the only thing going on. Even though in the moment it might feel all-consuming, it's never the only thing going on. Look outside. Walk into a different room. Turn your hands over. It's never the only thing going on. There are things we can do to help us notice that this 
this moment that we're in that is feeling so all-consuming is way bigger and contains actually possibility and opportunity that we were not aware of when we were focused on the worry and the doubt and the fear. Now notice I didn't say erase the fear. I didn't say obliterate the fear. I didn't say, oh, here's the trick. Say to yourself, don't think that. <laughs> erase. Erase. I forgot about that one. Cancel. Good luck with the, oh, cancel. <laughs> Stop crying. <laughs> so the other piece about taking in our surroundings is that it creates a space, this is a big idea now coming, it creates a space where we can actually honor the fear, the doubt, whatever it is that we are feeling. We can honor it. Instead of judging it, instead of wishing it away, we can honor it. It is an expression coming through us and deserves our honoring. Step two, look closely at our options. Discern what the first next step is that will take us in the direction that we need to go. What's the first thing? The closest thing, the most immediate thing, not the thing that is in Albuquerque, not the thing that is in New York. What is the most immediate thing that is right in front of me where I can make a new choice? So step one is take in our surroundings and create a space to honor all of it. Second is to look closely at our options and look, bring, bring them closer and closer and closer until we can see the first step, the most immediate step. And then steps three through six are repeat, repeat, <laughs> repeat, <laughs> and repeat. I leave you with this. Start close in. Don't take a second step or a third. Start with the first. Close in. The step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way of starting. Start with your own question and give up on other people's questions. Follow your own voice. Start right now. Take one small step you can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first. Start close in with the step you don't want to take. My thanks to David White. And my thanks and love to you.